In February of 1978, five men, collectively known by their parents as The Boys, left their Yuba City homes and traveled 50 miles north to Chico, California, to watch UC Davis, their favorite college team, play a basketball game. They made it to the game that night and watched UC Davis destroy Chico State. According to people who saw them there, they had a great time. We can only hope that that is the truth. Due to circumstances that remain shrouded in mystery to this day, the boys never made it home to say. Hello there, friends, and welcome to the Paranatural Podcast. My name is Ben. And I'm Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> He's Jake. And we are so glad to have you with us tonight as we try out a type of tale that will be a little unique to this show. A tale that would lead us into the land of unresolved enigma, the tale of the Yuba County Five. Jacob, we're here, buddy. How the fuck you doing? We're here. We're (laughs) here. Yeah. Yeah. It's been long enough, huh? I know. It feels good to be back in front of the microphone. People almost miss us, I bet. Oh, well, maybe. Their aim will improve, though. Yeah, yeah. I guess we'll find out. Yeah, if anybody listens to this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we got one fan out there. I'll listen to it. Yeah, I might, too. No, I probably won't. <laughs> no. <laughs> Only to edit it. Only to edit it. Now... I'm going to be straight with everybody. I'm really kind of excited to get into this episode tonight, but before we can do that, there's, um, you know, a couple things, couple, couple, two, three things to, you know, kind of take care of here. And, uh, I think we should just start with the, uh, proverbial pachyderm on the premises. <laughs> it's a good thing you got that pop filter. I know. Right. So for starters, uh, we, we just want to say thank you to everybody for sticking around through our recent impromptu hiatus. It uh, wasn't exactly something was planned or intended, but uh, was more of an inopportune inundation of circumstances, if you will. That that That's that's a real fancy way to say, look, y'all. Uh, Sorry. I had a really, really busy schedule going on, and, uh, uh, you know, it was on my end, of course. I, I just, uh, I thought I, I would be able to handle it and balance everything, but no, I, I was fucking wrong, so... But hey, we're back. We're back. We're back. We're back. The boys are back in town. And I and I know you, Jacob, you've been you've been real busy with shit too. So Oh. Yeah, I've been busy, but you know, I'm back. Yep. We're back. Back in the saddle. We're back. I'm baby. gonna make a whole bunch of different uh music lyric quotes. <laughs> eh, okay. <laughs> it's what we do here. So yeah, again, um, just we really appreciate everybody sticking around for understanding and you know just for being the best damn bunch of listeners on the planet son of a bitch give yourself a pat on the back y'all are awesome and i mean i mean all y'all like all both of you even you (laughs) all right you know who you are (laughs) now that the elephant has been acknowledged and thusly extricated (laughs) <laughs> there, <laughs> there are a couple of beautiful human beings who have earned themselves some special recognition, Jacob. Ooh. The uh, foremost mention, and by foremost, I mean in order of most overdue to last overdue, I want to give a big, massive thank you to the newest member of the Paranatural Podcast Patreon, Evelyn Resendez. Evelyn, thank you so much for choosing to give your support to the show. It is truly and immeasurably appreciated. So, I think we did... Uh, are you sure? I'm pretty sure our last episode we did. That was a review. Ah, well, thank you, Evelyn. You are a sweetheart, and I hope you enjoy the show. Well, I... You better enjoy the show if you're doing that. I so, mean, yeah. apparently, I guess she does. Uh, yeah, so I think that's what that means. Yeah, may the uh, may the ghosts bless you and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you're a pretty rock and roll lady. That's right. And listeners, if you like Evelyn, would like to be a rock and roll lady or dude or whatever, and help support the show, 
go ahead and open your web browser. Like right now, go ahead, open it. Well, unless you're driving, then pull over first and then open it. Okay, got it? Now, head on over to patreon.com slash paranatural podcast and become a Patreon subscriber. For just $5 a month, which is less than half the price of an Archie McPhee electronic yodeling pickle on Amazon, you will become an integral part of the show and be, for all intents and purposes, something like a producer. Now, what that means fully is that your very soul, probably, will gain nourishment by knowing that your donations are helping to create more interesting and in-depth episodes by funding research materials. You will, perhaps, find a zen-like peace of mind knowing that you are helping to ensure that a broken piece of equipment can be replaced quickly enough that the show won't suffer because of it. On top of that, you will plausibly... Become immune to any emotional coldness you encounter in the world as you find yourself swaddled in the cozy warmth of the indescribably vast and eternally existing appreciation and affection that the Paranatural Podcast will have for you. And if the priceless plus $5 a month benefits of getting a huge boost to your karma, allegedly a possibly permanent meditative mental calm, and maybe being shielded from negativity isn't enough of a reward for you, you also get exclusive members-only access to bonus episodes and the inalienable right to brag to anybody you want, if they don't run and hide from you, when your name is lifted in glory on the show for all the world to hear. So if any of that sounds good for you, hop on the interwebs and browse on over to patreon.com slash paranatural podcast or click the link below in the description. <laughs> Look, we have not podcasted in a month and a half, and I have a lot of words that are just built up because of it. Holy floppy asses, Ben. <laughs> Goodness. Damn, my vocabulary just shrank because I forgot my whole vocabulary, but then it grew again. Okay. <laughs> the next outstanding individual left a five-star review on the show's website, paranaturalpodcast.com. It reads, spectacular. Really appreci appreciate you guys and the hard work. I, too, have not heard some of the topics and creatures y'all bring up. That review was left by Rebecca English, who has been a supporter of the show in every way since the beginning. And I mean literally the very beginning. From continuing to listen, to suggesting episode topics, to sharing the show on social media and everything else, she has been a real OG. So, Rebecca, thank you so very much, not only for the kind words in your review, which is the kind of thing that makes the work well worthwhile, but also for all the effort you have put in to supporting the show and for sticking around all this time. It really means a lot. Rebecca, you're a rock and roll lady. I love you. And while we're here, there is one more person who has consistently gone above and beyond with their support that I really feel does not get nearly enough recognition. So Miss Emily Kadar, you are undoubtedly an incredible person, a true friend of the show. And your kindness is awe-inspiring. Yeah. Really, yeah. you do a lot, a very, and we do appreciate it. A very thank you to you. You are a rock and roll kick-ass lady. Damn and straight. Yeah, yeah. All the kick-ass, all the rock and roll. Well done. Thank all of you. you. All you motherfuckers. Mwah, to all of you. <laughs> that was a kiss noise. Not the band. That would have been gay. All right, Jacob. Me? Now that the housekeeping is all taken care of... Let's get to tonight's topic, shall we? We shall. All right. So the first thing that everybody needs to know is that tonight's episode is not going to be the usual Paranatural Podcast type of episode. We're not letting Derek run another episode, are we? <laughs> no. Uh, for starters, there, there kind of isn't a lot of funny to be found in the story. Oh. Yeah, I know. Uh, not only because there is some kind of gory stuff at the end of it and a little bit of sexual stuff that like that part I'm going to, I'm going to make real brief and you know, I'll make sure I mention it like right before we get there just so, you know, and we can gloss over it a little bit. Really. It's, it's not even that that makes it not funny. The, this story is just kind of fucking sad. So just so you guys know, um, aside from that, the, 
biggest digression from the norm is that there is nothing paranormal in this one. Like, no ghosts, no UFOs, no big feats, no nothing. <laughs> this one, I guess, falls more in the realm of, of, like, true crime or unsolved mystery, since there's no real evidence of a crime, I guess. Like, I don't know exactly how it would be categorized. All I know is that it is not the sort of thing that you, dear listeners, are used to getting from the show. And to be real, it is not the sort of story that I would usually pay any attention to, let alone the kind of story that usually sticks in my mind the way that this one has. Truth be told, I, I honestly can't think of a single other story like this that has stuck with me at all. Like, I can't even name one. Um, but... For reasons that I have yet to ascertain, the story of the Uni Yuba County Five has lived in my head rent-free since I first heard about it in 2017. There's just something about who these five men, the boys, were that, I don't know, I guess kind of touched me when I learned of them. And mm. <laughs> not that way. <laughs> <laughs> and... The circumstances of their unfortunate fate leaves questions that will never be answered, but that my mind can't help but ponder over from time to time. So with that being said, I really hope you guys will give this diversion a chance, but if you are here specifically for the usual paranormal goofiness and you decide to sit this one out, I understand. So Jacob, I'll see you later. Uh, <laughs> just come on back next time and the fun and fuckery will resume. All right. I'll see you next week. Bye. All right. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jacob's Jacob's not, not as excited about this as I am, but true crime blows dick by the end of this, you will love it. I promise. Okay, I don't promise, I but I think you will. You already gave me permission to sit out. <laughs> I rescind my offer. No, said Jake with a smile on his face. <laughs> now, in the cold no. open, which is the bit before the music starts, I mentioned that the events that we are talking about occurred in 1978. What I will add to that here is that the story spent 40 years being, for all intents and purposes, completely unheard of. What was reported about it at the time, namely by the Sacramento Bee between February and June of 1978, was thoroughly overshadowed, buried beneath more sensational, attention-grabbing stories like Ted Bundy's arrest and Roman Polanski's escape to France. As such, the tragic tale of the Yuba County Five was all but forgotten. That is, until a post in the Unresolved Mysteries Reddit thread appeared in 2017 and breathed new life and interest into the case. Fucking good old Reddit. It's either pure gold on there or it's a fucking dumpster fire. There is no in between. <laughs> no. Half the funny things I read on, on for the podcast is on Reddit. Right, that's the dumpster fire part. <laughs> so, from that Reddit post, the story got picked up by various podcasts, because that's how we roll. And that's where I first heard it, on a now functionally shut down show called The What If Podcast. And now, I'm sharing it with all of you. And I just wanted to give that credit. Shout out to the Sweary Boys, Ryan and Spencer. I doubt they will ever hear this, but you never know. All right. 1978. It's a good year. As I also mentioned earlier, the boys were heading to Chico for a basketball game. For most of us, a trip like that wouldn't be any sort of big deal. It might be fun, and it might be exciting if you were into basketball and going to see your team play. But otherwise, it's a fairly run-of-the-mill thing to do. For the boys, it was a little different. To varying degrees, all five of these men were mentally disabled. Ted Weir was described as having a childlike sense of wonder about him. He loved making friends and asking questions about everything. According to his brother Dallas, there was a fire in their house one night, and when Dallas ran into Ted's bedroom, 
Ted was laying in bed, watching the ceiling burn. When Dallas began to pull his brother to safety, Ted responded by telling Dallas to leave him alone. He had to work in the morning. (laughs) Jackie Hewitt was Ted's best friend. From the day they met, they were all but inseparable. Jackie was described by his mother as a delight. A biased opinion, to be sure, but we'll roll with it. Jackie is considered the most disabled of them all. He had a slight droop to his head and was often slow to respond when spoken to. He could not read or write, and when he had to make a phone call, which he despised and, yeah, same, Ted Weir would be the one to dial for him. Still, he was said to be an intensely happy person who loved playing with his beagle, who was of course named Bo, and riding around his parents' property on a 90cc Honda. Bill Sterling spent a lot of his childhood at the Napa Insane Asylum. As an adult, he was a devout Christian who spent his time reading scripture to impaired patients in the hospital and going to the library to research people with mental disorders. For a time, Bill worked at Beale Air Force Base as a dishwasher, but his mom made him quit after he got a bit schnockered and she blamed the airman for getting him drunk and taking his money. (laughs) Jack Madruga, who went by the nickname Doc, had served in the Army as a truck driver for two years. He was said to be slow, but overall was a good student in high school. He was largely independent despite his handicap, and could handle his own finances and drive and all that good stuff. His pride and joy was his turquoise and white 1969 Mercury Montego, which is a beautiful fucking land yacht of a car. He kept his car immaculately clean and never let anyone else drive it. The last of the five, Gary Mathias, was a bit different than the rest. For starters, until a journalist named Benji Yagel did some digging after the 2017 Reddit post, much of Matthias's past was a mystery. Matthias, at 25, was one of the youngest members of the group. He wore thick glasses and had played football in high school until a bad acid trip landed him in the psych ward during his sophomore year. After that, he became a habitual drug user for the rest of his high school career, and continued to be such throughout his military service in the 70s. He was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and received a medical discharge from the Army. But that wasn't until he got locked up for going AWOL in 1973. During that time, there was an incident involving two MPs. Gary requested that they come to his cell, and when they did... He came strolling out in his birthday suit. He then proceeded to spit on the officers before punching one of them and getting into a tussle with the second before finally being subdued. Birthday suit means naked. (laughs) It does. Sans clothing. (laughs) Less than a month after Matthias got out of the army, he was at his cousin's house visiting with his cousin and watching TV while his cousin's wife was in the bedroom sleeping heavily due to the side effects of her medication. And, yeah, this is the part I mentioned earlier. The, uh, the part, the disclaimer part. to the bone. Yeah. So, just a heads up there. If there's sensitive ears nearby or whatever, I'm going to, I'll do my best. But At some point during the evening, Matthias got up from the couch claiming to need to use the bathroom. When he didn't return for quite some time, the cousin went looking. He found Matthias in the bedroom with his still sleeping wife, and yeah, Gary was um, being gropey. Yeah, I think that kind of gets the point across. Somehow, the cousin refrained from just shooting Gary right then and there, and instead asked what the fuck he was doing. Matthias replied to that by saying that he wanted to kiss the woman. 
The cousin threatened to call 911, and according to police records, Matthias responded by saying, Good, I want to go back to jail. Later that month, he pled guilty to battery of a peace officer and assault with intent to R word. Yep, yep, yep. The assault with intent part was dropped as part of a plea deal, and Matthias spent only eight months in jail. After he got out, he was picked up again for smoking meth and popping bennies. <laughs> That's an old term right there. Benzodiazepines? Yes. Now, for those that don't know, those types of substances do not interact well with paranoid schizophrenia. <laughs> and they made no. Matthias violent. <laughs> At a drug dealer's house, he threatened to stab the dealer's girlfriend in the jaw before turning his attention to a three-year-old child and stating, quote, I thought I killed you once. I guess I'll have to do it again, end quote. The couple got Matthias out of the house where he proceeded to beat on the door until the cop showed up. Somehow, it appears he didn't serve any time for this one. <laughs> to round out his rap sheet, there was a suspicion of Grand Theft Auto, disturbing the peace, driving without a license, a handful of bar fights, and one count of prowling around a cemetery at night. Now, how is that a crime? I do not know. In 1974, he was finally sent to a state mental hospital. After his time there, Matthias tried college, but ultimately dropped out. There was one more incident in 1975 where Matthias broke into the home of a Yuba County couple by punching out a window and unlocking the door. No. When the couple awoke, Matthias told them that he was looking for a ring to return to Satan. And then he told them that he was their landlord and he was looking for the rent. It wasn't until after all of this that Matthias was prescribed medication for his schizophrenia. Yeah, about fucking time. Jesus Christ, on a motorbike. <laughs> like, well, fuck, you think that might be helpful? Goddamn. Jesus Christ on a motorbike? I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Jesus I guess Christ on a motorbike. Yeah, it might be helpful. But no, the medication, <laughs> jackass. I'm like, fuck. No kidding. So after somebody finally actually helped the poor dude, Gary's life actually improved, and he went without incident right up until the events that we're talking about tonight. Now, I know that I just spent a lot of time painting a very not pretty picture of Gary Mathias, and I really just want to make it clear that while I can't say he's entirely blameless for his actions... I will say there were also a lot of people in the quote unquote system who are equally, if not more to blame. Like for real, the guy had been diagnosed for years and nobody did shit. I mean, I'm not a mental health or medical professional or anything like that. So aside from the medication that they eventually gave him, which apparently helped, I'm really not sure what they could or should have done but they damn sure could have done something more than just looking at him and going, well, Mr. Matthias, you have paranoid schizophrenia. What that means is that you have, you have some wiring that isn't wired right, and it could cause you to do irrational things and might make you a danger to yourself and others. All right, good luck with that. <laughs> That's all they did to the poor fucking dude, man. They should have nipped that one in the bud. Yeah, I mean... I, first off, I don't know why they didn't just give him medication to begin with. Right? Yeah. Like, nowadays, you go in and you're like, hey, I fart more than normal. And they're like, <laughs> Here, I have a pill. here's antidepressants. Right? No shit. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know why they didn't give him the medication. Okay? Maybe they had a reason. But, and I guess this is just speaking for myself. If I was behaving like Gary Mathias... Lock me the fuck up and don't let me out till I knock it off. <laughs> I would, I'm serious. I would rather be stuck in there than know that I 
fucking hurt somebody, threaten to three, you know, any of that shit. Right. Like to me, that is the 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 preferable circumstance. Yeah. Uh a lot of that could have been avoided with proper medical attention. Probably most of it yeah. would have been avoided. He was having like just trouble after trouble after trouble after trouble, like nonstop since high school. He gets on the medication and he goes, I think it was at least two years with not one single issue. Not one. He got a job and he showed up every day and he didn't get in any trouble for anything and he quit doing fucking drugs. Like the medication fucking helped that guy. And I know it doesn't always help everybody, but you know, fuck. Give him a chance. So yeah, that's, I just wanted to clarify, you know, I, I, I really think it's important to understand who the boys were, including Gary, but yeah, that, that poor fucking dude. All right, moving on. Meat and taters or more uh, <laughs> people? Nope, 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 nope. We're done introducing taters. the cast of characters here. All right, so meat and taters, say it for me, Ben. I'm having withdrawals. We're getting, we're, we just got past the salad and now we're at the meat and taters. <laughs> I love it. All right. So if you have not figured it out by now, the boys love to fucking basketball. What? They loved it so much that they even got together and formed a special Olympics team. Aw. And they could be seen on game days proudly sporting their pristine clean by their mother matching yellow uniforms <laughs> so for those guys every game day was an exciting event in their lives but saturday february 24th was extra special the boys favorite college basketball team uc davis was playing a game that night 50 miles north in chico and the boys were fit and a go. Despite the fact that the boys were largely independent and often went places together, their families were a bit trepidatious about the trip. But the boys were determined to go, and their families relented. With $170 between them, a handful of California roadmaps, and hearts full of the thrill of adventure, the five men piled into Jack Badruga's Mercury, with Jack driving, of course, and headed out. They made it to the game that night. We know this because witnesses recalled having seen them there. One such witness was Bill Lee, the executive editor of the Chico Enterprise Record, which is a newspaper. He distinctly recalled seeing the group of five among a modest crowd and said it looked like they were having a great time. We also know that they stopped at Bear's Market around 10 p.m. The clerk on shift that night, a woman named Mary Davis, remembers them very well. When the boys came in to browse for road snacks, Mary was trying to close the store and was mildly annoyed with waiting on them so she could do so. They bought a Hostess cherry pie, a Langendorf lemon pie, a Snickers bar, a Marathon bar, two Pepsis, and a quart and a half of Moo Juice. <laughs> it's good road snacks. Eh. According to Mary, Mary Davis, the group was in high spirits, very obviously having a good time. Now, at 5 a.m. in the morning of the 25th, Emma Jean Weir, Ted Weir's mother. Oh, sorry, Emma Jean Weir. I said it wrong. It's a weirdly spelled name. Ted Weir's mother woke up with an uneasy feeling. She got up and began moving through a house that felt too still, trying to either placate her dread or locate the reason for it. She went into Ted's room and found his bed empty. This was the source of her unease, and the reason that the house had felt more empty than it should. The boys should have been back around midnight, and yet her son was not where he should have been. She immediately called Juanita Sterling, Bill's mother, 
who said that she had been up since 2 a.m., brought from sleep just like Imogen, with an inexplicable fear and a son who had yet to return. It was the same story from all the boys' parents, and at 8 p.m., Jack Madruga's mother contacted the police. The police began keeping an eye out for Jack Madruga's car, but it wasn't until a few days after the boy's disappearance was reported that they spread word to the media. Mary Davis saw the report the same day it came out and immediately came forward. Later that afternoon, a U.S. Forestry Service employee named Willard Burris walked up on Madruga's Mercury. It was stuck at the snow line on the old coach road in the Plumas National Forest, about 70 miles from Chico. Burris had first spotted the car on the 25th, but hadn't thought anything of it because the location was right by a popular hiking and snowmobile trail. The authorities hotwired the car and found that it was stuck in the snow, a situation that was easily rectified by pushing. Inside, they found the detritus left over from their snack stop at Bear's Market. Everything but the marathon bar, which itself was half-eaten, had been consumed. Also found in the car were programs from the UC Davis game, proof that they had indeed been in attendance. The formal search began on March 1st with a ground party and a helicopter from Highway Patrol combing the woods around where the car was found. On March 4th, an all-points bulletin was issued in the Brownsville area after Mr. Carol Waltz, owner of Mary's Country Store, claimed to have seen Jackie Hewitt and Gary Mathias on both Saturday and Sunday. A female customer of Mary's Country Store said she saw Ted Weir and Bill Sterling in the parking lot and Jack Madruga and Jackie Hewitt near a phone booth. She claimed... They were driving a red Chevy pickup. Now, Brownsville and Mary's Country Store are roughly an hour away from where Jack's car was found. So, you know. Another witness, 55-year-old Joseph Shones, went to the newspaper and told them his story. According to Shones, he had traveled up the mountain road around 5.30 p.m. on the 24th in order to see where the snow line was and then to hike to his cabin and check on it. He got back to his car around 11 p.m. and found that he had driven up just a bit too far and had gotten his car stuck in the snow. While trying to push his car out, Shones began having a heart attack. He got back in his car and laid down with the engine running and the heat on, hoping that someone would come along that could help him. Now from here, Shone's story comes in two very different flavors, depending on which source you read. According to the March 10th edition of the LA Times, around 11.30 p.m., Shone's heard a vehicle coming up the road and could see headlights. The vehicle stopped about 20 feet behind Shone's car and some men got out. Shone's crawled out of his car and called out for help, but the men simply got back in their vehicle and drove away. That, that's one version of the story. According to Cynthia Garney's WAPO article, Shone's first heard a whistling sound from down the road a little way. He then claimed he saw a group of men with a woman who was carrying a baby. He saw them walking in the glare of a set of headlights. They got close enough that he could hear their voices as they talked, but as soon as he called for help, the headlights went out and the voices fell silent. At this point, Shones lay back down and fell asleep. A couple hours later, he woke and saw what appeared to be flashlight beams outside his car's windows. Once again, he called out for help, and when he did, the lights went out and whomever was wielding the flashlights walked away. So those are the two 
different variations of story that Shones tells, and now they converge back into one story. Shones lay in his car until it ran out of gas, after which he got out and walked the eight miles back down the mountain road to the Mountain House Lodge where he was able to call for an ambulance. On the way down, he passed by Jack Madruga's Mercury Montego and even leaned on it for a moment. Now, while the majority of Schoen's claims cannot be verified, he was known to visit the Mountain House Lodge for a, you know, drinky-poo, and it was later confirmed that he had indeed suffered a mild heart attack. Now, in that same article, Emma Jean Weir argues that her son would not have ignored a man's cries for help. She notes that at one time, her son and Bill Sterling had gone out of their way to get a man to the hospital after that man had overdosed on Valium. Valium. That's what I said. Valium. <laughs> overdosed on Valium. <laughs> Also in that article, Gary Mathias' stepfather stated that Gary had to take his medication twice a day, three pills in the morning and three in the evening, in order for him to stay level, and that with no medication for two weeks, he would have been in some pretty rough fucking shape. That's not a quote, but that's, that was the uh, gist of it. Now by this point, everyone suspected foul play. Imogene Weir posited the theory that the boys were being held prisoner in Forbestown. Forbestown was a place that was, was described by its own postmaster as a haven for young people to drop out of society, which is really just a nice way to say that it was full of drugs and hippies. <laughs> now, Gary Mathias did, in fact, have a friend who lived in Forbestown. Big surprise there. But when they spoke to that friend, he claimed he hadn't spoken to Matthias in over a year. So. Now, the police, they were following as many leads as they possibly could. But it started to get pretty fucking hard to do because people from just all over the goddamn place began calling to report having seen the boys and crackpots began calling to just make these wild accusations about like celebrity people having abducted them or like this church doing it or whatever. It was, it got fucking wild for a minute. At the same time, the police were dealing with that. The ground search in the forest continued to be hampered by inclement weather. Six feet of snow had fallen on the mountain by this time, making snowmobiles a necessity just to get to the search area. An average for northern michigan all right all right <laughs> i mean it doesn't matter if the average for northern michigan is 30 feet six feet is gonna make it real fucking hard to find anything snow you can find snow you can find a whole well. lot of fucking snow and trees that are seven feet or taller that's all you're finding <laughs> <laughs> On March 19th, searchers discovered gold-colored cloth tied to a number of trees. The first piece was found 1.2 miles from the car's location, and it was presumed to be from the lining of one of the boys' jackets. The pieces of cloth seemed to mark a trail that went in the direction of a number of cabins. But nothing came of a search in that direction. Similarly, other hopeful occurrences in the ground search wound up only leading to disappointment. All right. So, spoiler alert, we're, we're coming to the end of this thing now, and I, I just, I just <clears throat> uh, kind of want to give everybody a heads up. Some of the descriptions I'm about to get into are not fucking pretty. They're a little bit gruesome, so... Everybody's been warned. You said meat and taters. They should know that. <laughs> oh, that's gross, given what I know about what I'm about to say. Anyway. There's a penis involved. If you're still here, let's go. <laughs> On June 4th, a group of motorcycle riders pulled off the highway and stopped on a little road to stretch their legs. At the end of the road was a little trailer 
with a busted out window from which the unmistakable smell of decay permeated the air. The bikers contacted the police, and a little more than three months after the boys had failed to return home, the body of Ted Weir was found inside a Forest Service trailer at the Daniel Zink campground. The campground is about five miles from Elk's Retreat, where the car had been found. But from the last place the boys' footprints were found, it isn't exactly clear how far the trailer was. According to an article in the Washington Post, the trailer was a 19.4-mile walk. But those who have checked the maps of the area, which is not me, I'm taking their word for it, have put the walking distance from the car to the campground more around 7 miles. So, yeah, it doesn't really matter, I think. Ted's body had been covered in a death shroud composed of eight sheets. He was fully clothed, yet his leather shoes had been replaced by Gary Mathias's canvas sneakers. Judging by the beard growth on Weir's face and the loss of about 80 pounds, it is believed that Ted had survived anywhere from 8 to 13 weeks in the trailer. The weight loss is particularly strange because scattered in and around the trailer were a number of empty sea ration cans, old school MREs. The cans had been taken from a broken into locker inside the trailer where they were stored for just such emergencies. Between the consumed rations and the ones still in the locker, there was enough food to have lasted all five of those men for a year straight. Investigations revealed that Ted's feet were frostbitten to the point of developing gangrene and blood poisoning. This, despite the fact that there was a propane heater in the trailer that was set up for emergencies, but had never been lit. There were also plenty of things like paperback books and furniture that could have easily been used to start a fire, but everything was intact. There was a gold watch that was missing its quartz crystal laying next to Ted's body. Who the watch belonged to is unknown. Led three and a half miles down the road by a scattered, disjointed, and accidental trail of blankets and rusty flashlights that had come from the Forest Service trailer, investigators discovered the bodies of Bill Sterling and Jack Madruga the following day. Jack's body was found lying face up in a stream in a bad state of decomposition. His right arm had been bitten off, and in the still-attached left hand, he was clutching his watch. On the other side of the road, and down an embankment, the remains of Bill Sterling were found. His body had been scattered by scavengers over an area about 50 feet long. That is, except for his skull which was located about 50 yards from the main part of his body. He was in such poor condition that he was only identifiable because of the presence of his wallet. Two days later, the body of Jackie Hewitt was found by his father. Yeah, the guy absolutely refused to not go look for his son, saying that he needed closure. That poor fucking dude. My eyes straight can't imagine. I just can't imagine. Yeah, I can't. I can't really find words to, uh, you know, say. Mm -mm. That's that's awful. Jackie's remains were found about a mile north, northeast of the trailer. Like Sterling's, his remains had also been scattered by scavengers, and he would have to be positively identified by dental records later on. 
Investigators concluded that Weir, Matthias, and Hewitt had all been at the trailer for a while, though it isn't clear why Jackie and Gary would have left. Due to the evidence, officials moved away from the idea that foul play was a, de was a determining factor in the case. Gary Matthias was never found, either alive or dead, though it is believed that he was the last to make it and that the trail of blankets and flashlights had been dropped by Matthias as he took his leave from the trailer with a bit more than he could reasonably carry. Other than that, to this day, we have no fucking idea what happened. There's nothing left but an entire lot of questions on what the fuck happened out there. Yeah. Yeah, that's... It's definitely strange. Yeah, there's just... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. The most questionable part to me is inside the trailer. You have literally everything you need to live on. Did it have water? Did it say if it had, like, a source of water? I mean, obviously it did. If if Ted made it 8 to 13 weeks, they were getting water from somewhere. I mean, snow melt. There was a stream nearby, like... And he lost 80 pounds in 13 weeks. 80 pounds, despite there being enough food to sustain five men for a year. Was he, like, a little overweight at all? Or yeah, the, like... um, so I, I, I didn't put that part in there, but Ted Weir, was he was, like, 32. And he had, like, a little bit of a beer belly. You know, he wasn't, like, fat by any means, but, you know, he but, had a little pudge on him. So 80 pounds is still very extreme for that. Uh, extraordinarily extreme for that. Yeah. Given the fact, I mean, you can, if you go like 13 weeks without eating, you'll lose a shit ton of weight. The question is, why the fuck wasn't he eating? And the locker that had all that food was open. It was broken. Yeah, into they broke it open. open. There were, there were empty cans of that food in the trailer and outside the trailer. And, and he was wearing the other dude's shoes. Yes. Which my theory on that is that like um, Gary Mathias switched those out before he left, like after Ted Weir died, because Ted was wearing more sturdy leather shoes. So I mean, he might have got that little bit of frostbite walking to the trailer. Yeah, which but absolutely possible. Why the fuck wouldn't you light the fire though? Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, these guys were you know mentally handicapped, sure. They were, I would have to guess, smart enough to know to light the fucking fire. Not only that, but stay put in some sort of safety slash shelter. Yeah, which, I Why mean, leave? apparently they did, but then they left. And I guess for reasons I don't know, investigators believe that, that Sterling and Madruga didn't make it to the shelter. Didn't they, make it? Yeah, they did not make it. The other three made it, but they they say, for like I said, for whatever reason, the other two died on the way. Maybe hypothermia, I'm guessing. I really don't know. And it was it was enough decomposition to where they couldn't tell how they died? Or do they think it was just like straight up elements? They they do think straight up elements. Nowhere was there ever found to be any you know, they weren't murdered. They didn't appear to have fallen off a cliff. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, because like that'll happen with the scavengers. That'll happen. Tear anything. Apart oh, yeah, for sure. It. But like be it being the elements, because something else, you know, that I guess I didn't mention because it's just something that I understand. But I'll mention it now for anybody playing at home. So Yuba City. California, it, it's it's fucking warm there. Chico, it's warm there. The path that they were supposed to be on, you wouldn't even really have needed a light jacket. As a matter of fact, Weir left the house without a jacket, despite his mother telling him he needed one because he's like, no, mom, I don't need one. So these guys were not at all prepared to go fucking walk about in the snow. So the elements could have fucking got them. Yeah. You know, it... It can happen to you pretty quick if you're in below freezing temperatures in a t-shirt. Hypothermia can set in real quick. Frostbite can set in real quick. Yeah. But why the fuck? For, but for 8 to 13 weeks, they never lit the fire? 
like Gary Mathias might have been, you know, schizophrenic, but he was also military trained and knew how to light a goddamn fire. And the thing is, is like, unless you are to the point where you have no ability to take care of yourself, like at all, like you don't know that you need to eat, you have survival. If you are more capable than knowing you need to eat and feeding yourself, you are like in your system, you know you need to survive and you will do things to survive. Yeah, your lizard brain takes over. Yeah, you like your subconscious will have you stay where it's warmer, where you're out of the weather. Yeah. You will eat. And like, while I guess it wasn't explicitly stated, I, I just kind of assumed that Ted Weir died of blood poisoning. From the feats. And gangrene and blood poisoning is, you know, right before it kills you, you're going to be sick as shit. Oh, yeah. But yeah, you he... don't be sick for 80 pounds worth of time. No, no, not at all. You know, the blood poisoning will kill you within a few days of it starting. Yeah, once it's you not get treated. that red line up to your chest, yeah. You know, so, I mean, that, you know, at least for the last few days or a week could explain why he wasn't eating. But what about all the fucking time before that? Yeah, yeah. A week, like, if you're working out extremely hard not eating or drinking, you lose maybe 15, 20 pounds if you are intensely training. And capable of losing that much. Chad probably wasn't even walking around if his feet were frostbitten. No, absolutely not. You know what I mean? If they're gangrenous, you're yeah, not it's gonna, gonna be, be able painful to as shit. Yourself. Yeah. So yeah, I don't I don't understand any of what happened. And that's even ignoring the fact that they had no business being up there. Yeah. I I, I was gonna say that you you said they were fifty miles from from where they lived. That so Chico is fifty miles from where they lived. Yeah. Where the car was found was seventy miles from where they went to see the basketball game. Away from their so house. So it's like or... it would have they 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 could have gotten there by making like a, a left turn or two off off of their route, but they had no reason to make that turn. And they went a long fucking way past that turn once they did. Until they got stuck. That they could have easily pushed their way out. Another part of that is the fact that fucking Jack Madruga loved that goddamn Mercury so much that at one point he was giving one of the other boys a ride home and refused to take him all the way to his house because the road he lived on was too rough. So what the fuck was he doing driving it up a mountain road? Like an old stagecoach logging trail up the fucking mountain. Yeah, this is this is a weird story. And then, I mean, I guess you got to make up your mind whether you believe this part or not. What about all that shit the heart attack dude was saying? What about it? There's three different stories. They didn't conjo conjoin. They but three if you, completely different if stories. Any of what he said is true. Who the fuck were them people? Well, so I was thinking about that when you were talking about it, but uh, like when you're when you're experiencing something traumatic like that. You see things. So as far as as far as his report goes, I I would say take it with a grain of salt because. So I kind of had that same thought. And if he had been having a massive heart attack, I'd be with you. But the dude still had enough in the gas tank to walk the fuck back down the mountain. And the second story. Or no, is that where he was that, found? That was that's where they picked him up at. Okay. So did did he make the call or did someone just find No, him? he made the call uh from a phone booth. Okay. So yeah, he walked his fucking ass back down the mountain. I don't think if you can do that, you are in the kind of pain and distress that would cause you to have such vivid hallucinations. Yeah. Like a lot of people who have mild heart attacks say that they go quite a while thinking they just got heartburn. I have never had hallucinations from heartburn. I've had some weird dreams from heartburn, but never hallucinations. So that's weird. So, yeah, which I mean, you it would be completely fair to disbelieve everything that man said, with the exception of maybe 
he saw the car on his way back down the mountain because that shit would make sense. But okay, so they said that he he leaned the car, like yeah, like was, he leaned on it, like to rest for a second. So couldn't they like check for prints or something? No real guarantee there would have been any. Because number one, you know, you can sit on a car and not leave fingerprints. Number two, he actually went up there knowing he was going into the snow. So I'm going to assume he had a coat and gloves and shit like that with him. And then the red pickup thing. How how long after everything? That was right shortly thereafter. Now, that whole part of it, I just kind of discredit all at once. Because you see something on the news or whatever, you know, oh, this person's missing. There are certain people in this world who they don't, they mean well by it, but like, but they could see five people and be like, I saw them. Yes. Yeah. And they didn't even see like five people. They saw four total. Yeah. Two, two by a phone booth and then two in the parking lot. The weirdest part of that is that the owner claims he saw two of them inside and then a whole different person saw some outside. But we don't know the relationship between the owner and that person in the parking lot. And one of them could have told the other and influenced their thinking. All right. Just because I'm a funny. (laughs) Is this located near Mount Shasta? That's weird enough to be. Where was Mount? Hold on. Okay. Okay. Please hold. (laughs) Yeah. We might have. We might have solved this, everyone. (laughs) Please still hold. Mount Shasta, Chico, California is two hours and five minutes away. So not really. I mean, California's huge, though. Well, I don't know why I didn't think to just do that, Serge. I was trying to look at maps and shit. <laughs> and it's... So... So realistically, if they were 70 miles away from Mount Shat or from Chico, 70 miles away from Chico, if they would have went north, like straight north, they were halfway there, I guess they would have been 50 miles away. Yeah. But still, I mean, I know you're just fucking around, but Mount Shasta Bigfoots are weird. (laughs) You said it in the trailer. But no, seriously, I don't, I, I don't think anything paranormal happened, obviously, but I mean, I guess you could do like what you just did and try to shoehorn something in there, but well, okay. There is actually one paranormal thing that actually really happened during the story. Ah! Sort of paranormal thing. During the search, one of the boy's mothers contacted a psychic who told the searchers where to look, but she was dead fucking wrong and an idiot. <laughs> and the sheriff's department said she was just in the way. So yeah. <laughs> she's a, she's a foreskin. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, you know, I guess you could blame aliens if you want. I can't prove otherwise, but I'm not doing it. All right. Well, a quick thing to lighten up the mood. I heard a joke at work the other day. All right, let's have it. And this joke comes from my 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 pal slash trainer slash everything at work. His name's Gary. He is a very, very decent human being. Um I've heard him swear maybe five times. He's Swearing doesn't make you a bad person, Jacob. Fuck. No, 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 but but he is he is all Christian y and Really good guy, though, like really, really good guy. So he told me this and just hearing it from him made it even more so shocking. But OK, so here's the joke. An alien lands his craft right next. To, and he told me this specifically to tell on the website or on the podcast. So an alien lands his craft right next to a gas station, walks up to the gas pump and he says, take me to your leader gas pump doesn't say anything it's a gas pump so he steps a little bit closer pulls out the ray gun and he's like 
take me to your leader? Gas pump still doesn't say anything. It's a gas pump. So he points it at him and he says, last chance, take me to your leader. Gas pump doesn't do anything. So he shoots it. Big explosion. Alien goes flying. Um, more aliens come pick him up. They're like, what the hell happened? And uh, the alien says, I don't know. But don't fuck with the things with a dick long enough to wrap them around themselves and stick it in their ear. <laughs> nice. I like it. <laughs> All right. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you so much for your patience, for your understanding, and for joining us right here on the Paranatural Podcast. We love you. We will see you next time. Good night. Make sure you shower regularly. Good night. Love you. (laughs) 